Hello and welcome to another edition, I don't know what number edition this is, of our vlog slash video cast, I don't even know what it is, um, but whatever it is, welcome, welcome to it. Um, and my name is Stuart Horsfield, and first of all I would just like to introduce for this particular edition, Mr Stephen Scrag. Stephen, are we okay? Oh well, thanks Stu, how's everything your end? Yeah, not, not too bad, everything is exactly the same I think as the last time we spoke, <laughs> pretty much. Football's so much a little bit things. nearer, but that's it. So say again, Stu. So, uh, football's a little bit nearer, but that's it. Yes, well, we're, uh, we're about three days away now. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's going to be you no know, a, a whole new, new, uh, new normal to get used to, I suppose. Ah. Be interested to see what they do with with the crowd noise if they introduce the crowd noise or whether they just go for the empty, hollow-sounding football ground approach. I'm, I'm thinking of getting some for this. I'm not going to lie. I'm, I'm thinking of getting some. <laughs> I, I, I think of getting some stuff. for this. Some kind of like 1970 canned laughter, yeah. you know, kind of like so make it seem like the good life or something like yeah, that. Yeah, and if we can have it just so it's slightly out of time. So <laughs> yeah. we think we're funny and it's just silent, and then when we're not, there's a little bit of laughter. Yeah. Um, Gary, how are you? I'm good, thanks, mate. Yeah, um, we've got Spanish football coming back a little earlier, so that started, uh, where are we now, Sunday, so that's on Friday. And I've got very much as... Uh, as in the Bundesliga, they've got the um, cam noise on, and they've also got some um, whole halves of the with the camera opposite the camera. The, there's like um, it's like a, a glass screen, and they project images of people onto there as well. So uh, oh, I watched a couple right. of games, and you, you do. I remember Steve mentioned this earlier. You know, you, you, you almost forget that there's no people there because the background noise is okay. Obviously, you know, there's no sort of Sinking with somebody in a bad foul, or because I suppose somebody's reaction with a temper, it's, it's okay, it's okay, it's possible, it's possible. So, yeah, um, yeah, I'm boss, be, yeah. Yeah. just watch Real Madrid. <laughs> so, yeah, football's back, so that's great. And uh, you know, as you say, can't wait for the English football's back as well. Excellent. And Aiden, football's back, yeah, that's true. Excited. Yeah. <laughs> uh, more mid table obscurity, trying to stave off. Uh, sinking into the relegation zone now. I can't be all right without it, thank <laughs> frankly. <laughs> I'm more interested in your shirt, Stu. It's, that's, that's more interesting. Like I say, uh, <laughs> it needs to be seen. <laughs> yeah, mums and, well, wives, daughters, have learned plenty of um, appropriate sewing skills from old t-shirts that were going to be thrown away. I've learned about European championships and semi-finals from about 30 odd years ago, and they've learned appropriate and practical skills. Um, oh, good. Okay, so today um, we're going back to, for me, I think probably one of the, certainly top three, but certainly one of the greatest European Championship um, games of all time. We're going back to 1984, in the semi-final between France and Portugal. And uh, now before we discuss this, obviously we like to watch the games um, b before we chat, any excuse to watch games before we chat about them. But I think the first thing that um, needs mentioning, Stephen, is BBC and ITV decided essentially not, 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 not to bother completely, but not to really bother turning up and filming any of it. Yes, uh, it was a, you know, no England was, was the primary reason for it. No, no British teams. Uh, Wales actually came the closest to qualifying. They came to a bit about 60 seconds of qualifying. They were reliant on Yugoslavia failing to get the result they needed in their last qualifier. And Yugoslavia came to within the 90th minute. Uh, when they, they got their goal to send them through to the finals instead. You know, again, one of those great sliding doors moments. You know, we would have had, you know, a major international tournament in the 1980s with, with Ian Rush, you know, Mark Hughes, Neville Southall, Kevin Ratcliffe striding across the, uh, the pitches of France rather than, than Yugoslavia. And I'm sure the cameras would have, you know, the, the TV companies would have picked it up very, very swiftly there. The, the were, you know, they the were meant to show it. They'd agreed to show it. BBC and ITV had come to an agreement where uh, one channel was going to show one group because it was of course, the eight-team European Championship, so two groups of four. One channel was going to show one group. The other channel showed the group. final, uh, And then quite late in the day, uh, ITV backed out of the agreement. So the BBC just decided to cherry-pick the games that they wanted to show live, which in the end amounted to the Spain West Germany decider in, in one of the groups and the final itself. So you know only two games were shown live in the UK and uh, and we missed probably the best European championship there's ever been. 
<laughs> it's funny. I was um, I was just about to come to that. Um, Aiden, I think picking a picking a tournament to miss. This was a massive error missing missing this tournament. It, to me, it, you know, it seemed to it seemed to have everything, literally everything. It wasn't ever what a tournament to miss. It, it was goals raining in left, right, and centre in some of these games. We weren't there. Incredible um, players and some great teams. I mean, Platini. Obviously, obviously, we'll talk about him quite a bit tonight. But this was his peak, the peak of his powers. He was absolutely everywhere. He was leading what was a great team, but leading it from the front and, and just dominating the tournament in a way that few others have. Uh, but in terms of the the entertainment, the sheer quality on show, it was uh, an incredible one to miss. I mean, as well as the, the teams we talk about here. You've got the likes of Denmark coming through, uh, which obviously in two years later in the World Cup would would um, reach huge notoriety. But they, they they did extremely well in this tournament and came within a penalty shootout of, uh, of the final itself. Um, if anything, well, it's a greater achievement than they actually did two years later in the World Cup when they when they took all those plaudits. Um, but that was that's not an isolated incident. There was a lot of terrific football and entertainment in this tournament and. Uh, it would have been a sweet spot in terms of age for several of us as well in our, in our youth, wouldn't it? But yeah, alas. it would. Um, I mean, Gary, is this? Uh, I mean, now it you know it, it seems unthinkable. I mean, should England, although UEFA and FIFA seem to be making it really difficult to not qualify for their competitions at the moment, <laughs> but in terms of was it? I don't want to say a, a jingoistic thing, but do you think it was a a question of of still that almost? the last throws of that attitude, well, if we're not in the competition, then it's not going to be very good? Um, I, do you know, I honestly don't know. Um, it might have been, and I don't know what they um, put on instead of the, instead of the football. Um, if you play that, I can actually tell you what was Tell me, Stevie, time. tell me. <laughs> I know that. I've, I've jotted it down before. I good a, man. This, is, this is research. This is what I call research. This, yeah, this, this was big research. Let's is see it the bill? I've jotted it down somewhere. But, yeah, we have. Some like Cervantes on Channel 4. We had um, a disaster movie on BBC One. And then so, we had something in homage to a 150-year-old obsolete bicycle on BBC Two. So, well, yeah, and, oh, The Gentle Touch was on ITV as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> I've, got, I've got no argument ever, really, have I? <laughs> I mean, I, 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 guess, I guess it's just how, how uh, the, you know, the main uh, channels valued um, football in those days. And, uh, you know, the fact that England weren't there, that it was assumed that people wouldn't be interested. And, you know, as the guys have said, didn't they miss a tournament? What a stupid trip that was. <laughs> My mum would have been happy. She loved the gentle touch. She absolutely, she absolutely <laughs> loved that program. She'll have been made up, made up with that. <laughs> um, okay, so... The game we're going to, I mean, obviously, like we said, the, the, we could do episodes on, on numerous games in this tournament, but obviously we've we've gone to the, the semi-final, um, France and Portugal, and I think before, you know, we, we'll look at France first, um, you know, it's, it's a similar side to the French side of 82 that perhaps should have got to the, um, the World Cup final were it not for a certain uh, Herr Schumacher, shall we say, um, and this was a, you know, a France side... I, Sometimes players arrive at their peak and sometimes sides arrive at their peak in a tournament. And this, this French European Championship side of 1984 is a, is a great example of just everything coming together at exactly the right, the right time, Stephen. I don't, know, I don't know if you agree with that. Yeah, it was, it was absolutely perfect. You know, I, I adored this French team. You know, I, I was quite you know, ambivalent towards them in 82 but it was so much my first World Cup and fell for Brazil and uh, you know even kind of like was won over by Italy in the end the fact that how they played in the final against West Germany you know won my respect as well but this French side you know I think anyone who watched them in that 1982 semi-final against West Germany couldn't fail to have a soft spot for them you know that huge respect for that side and you know, Platini was everything, but even then, you know, for me, Jures was the one that, that spoke to me more. You know, he was compact. He was, it was that vision that he had for the through ball. You know, everything facilitated through Jures and Platini, for me, I don't know, he'd have always been a class act, but I, I think he'd have been, I don't know, 75% of the player had it not been for Jures. 
But that was just an outstanding French side that just had talent all over the place. And I'd go to you know, Tegana was at his peak in this tournament. You know, this this game just boasts Tegana. You know, the, the way that he, he contributes to the winning goal eventually. We'll come to that later. But, you know, this is, you know, iconic. You know, this is you know, such a spectacular team. And, and, it, and they just felt a, an air of justice to them winning. I mean, you know, Gary. You know, for you, um, the you know the Carrie Magique. I mean, it's it's concept and it, and its qualities for those for those who may be well, certainly for those who are younger than us, all of us. Um, but you know, just just explain a little bit about about that magic square. Yeah. Well, this is this was actually the second um, incarnation of it because they had a, three of the four played in the World Cup that Steve was mentioned earlier. And uh, the guy who was missing, actually a sub in this game, it's the guy that David Bowie wrote a song about. And David Bowie doesn't write many songs about French international football, but Jean Genie was uh, <laughs> the one that he wrote about. So, you know, there you go. Um, I, and yeah, the Kala Magique was, uh, uh, um, it's a, was a wonderful um, footballing combination. Um, it, was, uh, it was like a string section. They were all artists, they all played a slightly different tune. A different way, but they, they, they blended together perfectly. And um, Platini was the uh, was the lead violinist, of course. Um, the, 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 but this team actually suffered from the same problem that the 1982 team suffered from. They didn't have a top, top striker. No, no, no French striker scored in this tournament until the very last minute of the very last game, when I think it was Bellon scored uh, the second goal against Spain in the final. But he played uh, in '82. He played with uh, Cisse and uh, Rushto, who were both midfield players as strikers, and, and he played with Cisse again here and uh, Lacombe, who was just very typical of French when they get to World Cups and European Championships. They don't have a striker. He's had when they, you know, um, uh, uh, when they won the World Cup as well, and um, Zidane had to score the goal because there's no strikers, but. Uh, the the the, the kind of machine was magic enough to make up for all the space. But an interesting thing, just last reflection on eighty two to 80, 80, uh, 84, is when the last qualifying game of the um, of the the group, uh, Spain played um, Germany, and Makeda scored the winner for Spain in the last minute. And if he hadn't scored, uh, Germany would have qualified. I think they would have played France. So we'd have had a rematch between Patrick Artiston and uh, Herr Schumacher. It might have been a bit leveled up to come there. Like you said, the sliding door moments. Sliding door moments, yeah. Um, you know, Aidan, for you, you know, looking at, you know, sort of, we're still, you know, we're in the eight team tournament. Um, you know, you, you top two go through and, you know, and it's straight into the semi finals. There's no round of 16 as there is now, no quarter finals. And, you know, as the guys have mentioned, I mean, France were, were imperious, certainly from that, from the second game onwards, they just stroll through, through their group. It did. Well, I guess you could include the last 10 minutes of their opening game where they, that was against the, the what was to become a good Denmark side and we, we didn't all know it at the time, I guess, um, to, to quite the extent we did. But it was a very lethargic start, I think, from the French who Platini rescued them late on in that game with the first of his nine, I think, goals in the whole tournament. I guess they didn't need a striker too much, Gary. <laughs> That'd be the other way of looking at <laughs> your point there uh, with Platini in this form. But yeah, following that uh, late escape, um, they also adjusted after this point to a three-man defence, partly through necessity because uh, Manuel Amaros had got himself sent off in the Denmark game for headbutting Jesper Olsen, which is never a good idea. Um, and they adjusted to a three-man defence following that. Now that had a few effects. It, it brought uh, a couple of characters into the team that we'll we'll talk about in due course in this semi-final, who had a, a key role, the, the left back Domer, but also it freed up the midfield a bit more uh, to, to attack. So it kind of unleashed the attacking talents. So partly through necessity, they've ended up in a position where they're suddenly free scoring 5-0 against Belgium and then a, a terrific game, 3-2 against Yugoslavia to top the group with, with maximum points. Platini scoring a hat-trick in both of those. So from just three group games, he'd already got himself seven goals, uh, and including two hat-tricks in a row. So they were on fire by this point. Um, racing away through. So uh, by, by this stage, they, they are, if they weren't already, they were certainly favourites by this point. 
Uh, and I suppose you know that's, it's a great way to contrast, Stephen. If you know, if we if we then look at, at Portugal, first tournament since the nineteen sixty six World Cup in, um, in in England, of course. Um, you know, and you know, going into you know going into this semi final, it it appeared to be a very much a, a foregone conclusion. Would it be fair to say? Yeah, I think so. You know, this this was one of the, the great things about tournaments at that time was. You know, the, the great unknown and finding something else. You know, there, there was always something new to learn. So whereas in 82, you know, we, we all sat up and took notice of, of Patini a whole lot more than we had done before. And uh, by the time you get to 84, you know, France is familiar. We know who they are. You know, we know what we're looking for. So it's a bit like when we go to the 1986 World Cup and everyone's wait, waiting for more of, of Zico and Socrates. You know, you learn from the previous tournament, you take it into the next one. There was nothing you could take into this tournament from Portugal because, as, as mentioned, they'd not played a major tournament for 18 years. You know, they hadn't made such a, a big impact in European club competitions. There was, they, they were just one of the most invisible teams imaginable to, uh, to, to, you know, to British eyes, basically. So, yeah, everything that they did was something new. You know, we, we didn't know what they were about. We didn't know who, was, who the star players were. But uh, yeah, on the way to the semi-final, I'd say they played the percentages. They played a conservative kind of approach to it. They were looking for France to do them a favour against Spain. I don't think they had any illusions that it was going to be Spain and Portugal going through to the semi-finals. Sorry, West Germany in the group stages. Um, so yeah, you know, by the time they get to the semi-finals, they, they are still somewhat of a, an unknown quantity especially given the fact that we've not seen any of the games live up to this point, even this, well, even this game, you know. And I, I will, we'll come to the, I'll come to the progress in a sec with you, Gary, but um, I, I'd, we're in the middle, we're doing a Euro retrospective um, series and where we're looking at past games. And I, uh, I picked this game as one of the games to write about. I know I've chatted with Aidan a little bit about this, but, you know, looking at some of the key players like um, like Stevens at their age, and you know, from '82, you know, the, the names were sort of there for us to for us to look out for two years later. But with Portugal, it was very much um, a, new, a new entity, should we say? You know, for me, you know, and we'll come to this guy a little bit more as we get as we get into the game. But for me, it was all about certainly the game, the um, the goalkeeper Bento for Portugal. Very much so. Uh, I mean, it'd been a long-standing career. Uh, stalwart of the game I guess for, for Portugal he was well into his 30s by this tournament but yes I mean, the, the way he played in this game was absolutely astonishing I, mean, I think given the way Portugal progressed far less prolific of course than the French they only scored twice as opposed to France's nine in the groups so they needed a solid defence if they were going to get anywhere and yeah with Bento in goal that some of the saves he pulls off on in this particular game were astonishing but he'd been solid throughout the groups as well as had the defence as a whole. Um, they'd only conceded once, which was in a 1-1 draw with Spain. So they, they were a solid team, if less spectacular, of course, than the French. That's not to say they didn't have a bit of an attacking threat as well. The likes of Jordao and Chalana were the two key forward players, but Bento was, without doubt, their, their star man, certainly in this semi-final as well. And Gary, you know, just before, before we get to the game, like you say... Is, you know, it was a really interesting point, like you say, I had not realised it, it's just how close, you know, the games, the semi-final lineups literally turn within the last, I think it's about the last six or seven minutes um, of the entire group. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, as, as the guys have mentioned, you know, um, France were rattling the goals in like there's no tomorrow, you know, they scored nine in the qualifying group and um, the Portuguese had scored twice. Uh, and that uh, a nil-nil draw and a one-nil, uh, sorry, one-one draw with Spain, and that beat Romania one-nil, which got them through after Mercado's last goal, uh, last minute, last Mercado, I think, pardon, his last minute goal against uh, against Germany. Just, just quickly, just jumping on, on Bento. I mean, age was a massively interesting guy this year. He was actually two days short of his 36th birthday in this in this, in this game, um, and he played, he continued playing for Benfica. Bear in mind, we're talking this is 1984, and he was 36 all but two days. He played for Benfica up until 1992. That's a further eight years. So he's playing for Benfica, uh, you know, top level football, well into his 40s. Um, amazing goalkeeper, you know, and we talk about being goalkeepers being sort of uh, having a lovely lifestyle now because of increased fitness, but this is going back 25 years. 
you know, but it's gone back, no, it's gone back, gone back 35 years, I beg your pardon. Um, <laughs> that's an exceptional, I mean, exceptional thing. Um, but you, you're right, it was a, it was the, the qualifying groups came to a crescendo, um, a, a very much the way this, this, that this game does as well. I always would like this game to, uh, to a kettle. You bear with me, but you know, we put the water in, it's a bit, it's a bit still, it starts pretty quietly and it gets a little bit warm afterwards and uh, as you go through the second half the heat increases and it comes to the extra time and it's bubbling away and boiling away and I tell you what at the end it's time to have a cup of tea. <laughs> um, I mean we'll, you know we'll, we'll come to the game you know we've got you know we've got plenty of time we've, you know we've still got sort of 20 minutes to chat chat about the game and stuff and, and which is strange because we've built this game up to be one of the greatest games that we've ever seen albeit by a different YouTube channels as per, as per usual but the first half, not there's not a lot to write. There's not a lot to write about in the first forty-five <laughs> minutes. Um, you know, in you know, watching it back, it for me, like I say, I watched it relatively recently for the article and watched it again for this. And to me, it just looks like the most perfect French summer, summer's evening. It just, it just seems like such a storybook evening that that this game is about to be played and the game is set in. Everything, like I said, everything just seems set for the French and. You know, to begin, you know, the first goal you know, of the first half, Stephen, it's a, it's a free kick, it's the edge of the area, and you just assume that Platini will step up and it will just be repeat, you know, and you know what the outcome is, but it um, doesn't quite turn out like that. No, it doesn't at all. I agree about the, uh, the kind of like the ambiance of the stadium oh, and everything. And right. that, yeah, absolutely. It's one of the things I picked up on watching it was, yeah, it was like the length of the shadows of the players yeah. and, and you know stuff like that and it's the fact that it's played in an era where kind of like the stands aren't the towering edifices that they are nowadays you know there were there were roofless stands so you know you had the sun shining down from a from a dipping perspective so yeah it's the long shadows it's the yeah it's absolutely everything that surrounds that first half in a way it's just that's what captures the first half but even so even though there's very little in the way of of uh, action as such apart from the opening goal what I found with that first half was that the pace was still unremitting, yes the clear cut chances didn't come but the pace was absolutely electric it was absolutely you know, it, it was just one movement to another, the ball kept on going, the players didn't stop and there was a, a relentless pace to the game despite the fact that the openings weren't coming and yes, it was predominantly France and Portugal were, were striking on the break here and there. But yeah, in the final third, the chances weren't coming. But yeah, that opening goal completely filled the uh, the French director. You know, he flashes a Patini, uh, our commentator, who we've since found out, yeah, it was indeed Peter Brackley. So we were watching ITV's uh, coverage of the game, but what didn't go out live. So he's fooled by who scores the goal initially. But yeah. I, th I think it probably filled everyone in the ground, probably included the goal scorer himself. You know, I'm, I'm sure it was worked on in training to take them by surprise. Everyone's expecting Patini, but up, up steps the mur, and uh, and it flashes into the back of the net in in true Platini fashion. Yet it isn't Platini. Mm -hmm. Gary, and the other the other thing for me, Gary, as well. You know, I know you talk about the magic square. The the other thing that I noticed at kick off is Platini and Tigana have shirts untucked, and I wanted because I watched to see when they come out. And the national anthems they're tucked in, and I'm like, what? "So when is it? When when do they?" And sure enough, at kick off, the shirts are out, the shirts are untucked, and even even that is almost of its of its time as well. That just that French swagger that this is how we're going to look on the football pitch. Yeah, that's, that's a good point actually. Yeah, um, it, uh, uh, there again, you know, they did a similar thing in '92, and a couple of the players, and I can't remember who they were. Playing the socks rolled down as well, and one had the shitty shin pads flapping all the time, which is not drive the war, but they were doing something to watch then. Now, it's, it's interesting about Demer. It was his birthday as well um, when he scored, and he, he only scored two goals in his hot, in his international career, which wasn't that long anyway. Um, both in this game, so you know, if you're going to pick your goals, pick your time, kiddo, and you certainly do. <laughs> um, but it's interesting, as, as Stevie says as well, that um, you know the, the French director um, did think it was Patini. And when they his second goal, it was also mis, mislabeled, and I can't remember who he called it for. Um, wait, that was it. Was it Ballon? It was Ballon because Ballon was a substitute by then, but it wasn't. So you know, on your birthday, score two goals and get misidentified by the parish in times. You know, I mean, 
talk about riding on your birthday cake. I mean, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but yes, so so going back here, yeah, that the, the it, there's a, there is a certain swagger, there's a certain elegance, there's a certain uh, joie de vivre, shall we say, about the French team and the way they played. And uh, if one player um, exemplified that is Platini. Uh, you know, players have great moments in their careers. You know, you can almost identify when they reach their peak. This this was Platini's. This tournament was Platini's peak. Not only because the goals he scored, but the way he played. Uh, Talk about leading your team, you know, and amazing performance. Um, Aidan, I'm, I'm going to give you first crack at the second half, Aidan, because the, the, the guys have had the goals and the swagger. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to give you first crack at the second half. And, you know, Stephen talked about the un, unremitting and unrelenting pace of the first half. The second half, just it, it, that's when the game just becomes so incredible to, to watch. Well, this was France as though they flicked a switch and just attacking at will. It's as though they've remembered how they were in the group stage. I guess the, the first glimpse of it had come in the, the final few minutes of the first half. There'd been a lovely bit of interplay with Jures and Fernandez to get through. It ended up being offside, but lovely bit, bit of interchange. And that, I guess, was the first sign of what they were capable of, and they just hadn't been able to do up to that point. Second half, it was attack at will. It was absolutely majestic play. And I've noted down some of the, the great chances they got. It was Fernandez, Jures, Jures again, Platini, Platini, Platini. <laughs> All of them <laughs> saved. This was in the first 20 or so minutes of this uh, second half. All of them saved by Bento in a variety of spectacular uh, fashions. Excellent stuff. And this is after Portugal had adjusted their lineup to be slightly more attacking. So it's potentially... Uh, Portugal's fault. We talked about their solid defence earlier. <laughs> Maybe in uh, because they were trailing, of course, they, they they needed to chase the game a little bit, but that unwittingly unleashed the French, and they they were all over them for the first 20, 25 minutes of this second half. It was absolutely magnificent. But what they couldn't do, of course, was score, principally because of Bento, but. Uh, they, they deserve to be two or three goals in front by this stage. They they were that dominant. Uh, but of course, if you don't score, you often get punished. And it was only probably a five-minute spell that Portugal were any good in this in this half. They were out of it for the rest of it, largely. Uh, but of course, in that five or six-minute spell, they did get their goal. It, 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 and, and again, again, it's a it's a very unlikely unlikely source. Um, you know, from the you know from the port the Portuguese uh, the Portuguese goal as well, Stephen. Yeah, it's complete. It's all completely out of the blue, isn't it? I think that's that's the shocking thing about it, is that as, as Aidan said, France had chance after chance after chance. <clears throat> excuse me, at the beginning of that uh, second half, and uh, yeah, it was that slight alteration of, of formation. It's almost like they went from a four four two to a four five one, and <clears throat> I've got to say fair play to to the coach there as well because. He changed the formation again after Nene came on later in the game. So they even altered again to kind of like a 4-3-3 as they were trying to seriously push on and press back. But yeah, that, uh, that, that French equaliser, you know, I, the, the, I think the most iconic, so the, the Portuguese equaliser, I think the most iconic moments of it is as the ball loops in, it's how Bats falls into his own net. And, and it just kind of like makes the, the whole image what it is and it's just the sheer shock of it all as well because France mm -hmm. has been so dominant and so attractive they should have been three up you know they could have been way way out of out of Portugal reach and yeah a complete and utter shock that they uh, that they leveled up. I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna give you first crack at extra time Gary so so don't worry about that but Aidan for again I, I feel like we have a, a kinship here about this goalkeeper because I, I became more and more <laughs> obsessed the more I've watched this. <laughs> And it's that that fact, even even though so you know we talked about the atmosphere at the beginning of the game, and, and that Portuguese equaliser seems to almost suck the life and, and the belief out of the out of the party that that's been going on for the best part of seventy minutes up until the Portuguese equaliser, and then for for me a, a, a double save um, from Bento, first of all at Platini's feet, but the second save from Didier Cis is is unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, let's face it, France should have gone back into the lead at this point. You know, and yes, Bento had dived at the feet of Platini with it, just to get it with his hands. And the ball bounces off to Cease. And yeah, at first glance, it just looked like he'd shot against the bar. But no, you see it properly. And Bento's got his fingertips to it, just nudged it sufficiently off track to, to push it onto the bar. And absolutely astonishing 
Uh, and again, following Portugal's decent little spell where they'd got their goal, it was all France again. They were just pouring forward once more up until, say, the final five, six minutes or so when it, it flattened off where I think everyone was preparing their, themselves mentally and physically for, for another half an hour. But it, France were, again, the, the way they were linking up, Platini and Jures in particular, uh, through the midfield, it was absolutely majestic. And just in terms of you mentioning about the atmosphere as well, I think you mentioned the stadium too in its old design of actual velodrome style. You can see people on the velodrome track and it's, 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 it's gorgeous, isn't it? In a way that a modern stadium can't be. You know, it's so haphazard and random. And I think that just adds to the occasion as well, that a, a more modern, well-designed, shall we say, stadium just would never be. And that just added to it with the raucous atmosphere that, you know, tailed off, of course, when Portugal scored, but it was building up again towards the end. Uh, I think that just that's helped it all along. But yeah, Bento saving Portugal yet again. Uh, if only other things hadn't happened later in the game, he'd have been the man of the match. Oh, absolutely. So we'll, we'll we'll come to you, Gary. You can you can you can take us into extra time. So you know the, the guys, you know Aidan and Stephen have sort of you know set the scene. It, it's been all France. You know the Portuguese, my, my new footballing hero, the Portuguese goalkeeper, is has played an absolute blinder. And then we go into extra time, and then it, it's kind of the unthinkable happens. It is, and uh, I think one of the telling points is before they start the extra time is the players look absolutely out of their feet. Um, so I think, you know, when I mentioned about the pace dropping off towards the end of normal time, I mean, it did, you're right. And I think probably fatigue was setting in for both sets of players. And I think that also contributed to making the, guard, the extra time a lot more open, where the players could sort of, you know, chase back and, and defend with vigour. They, they just hadn't got the legs anymore. So it made it a real... That, that those uh, 15 minutes each way, the extra time were, were, were fascinating. And as you say, uh, certainly Portugal started to look dangerous, and, and Bats had to make a save. As Stevie mentioned, they brought uh, Cabrita brought uh, Nene on, and, it, and it's really weird because George Air, who scored the scored the scored both Portuguese goals, was wearing number three, and I'm pretty certain Nene was wearing number two. So he had two fullbacks, but well, they weren't fullbacks, but you know what I mean. Shirts of fullbacks went at strikers for Portugal, which is interesting. But that's made a good save from a, a header from Nene. And then, as you say, the, un, the unbelievable happened and the, across too far. And it wasn't, a, it wasn't a Van Basten sort of volley. I mean, the guy, when Jordan hit it, it hit the floor, <coughs> probably three inches away from where he hit it, <coughs> just ballooned over, um, over bats and... Uh, you know, both goals, Bats conceded. He must thought, you know, you have no left guys. Come on, give me a break. Um, because, you know, he couldn't plan that. And Jordao's celebration afterwards is, is something to behold because this guy thinks he's won, he's won the game and so nearly did. And then obviously you've got, you've got France. All of a sudden, you know, it's, it's piling forward and forward and the Portuguese are sinking further and further back to defend. And there's a bit of a scramble and... Uh, the Merck scores, although the commentator said it was Ballon, he, you know, got him wrong again. It's my blooming birthday, get my name right. <laughs> and uh, he, he, he scores the equaliser, and then you get that, the, the kettle boils, the kettle boils, and uh, Platini gets the, uh, I think it's Tagana, plays the ball through, and he's, the Portuguese defenders falling all over the place uh, as he pivots and smashes the ball into the net. And um, I, I know the one we watched was, was, um, was Peter Brackley, but I think Motson did a commentary on it for um, BBC, and he said something like, Platini throws open the gates of paradise for France, or, or something like that. And it always struck me as, you know, as a wonderful emotional moment. Uh, so, you know, talk about fantastic finish to a game. You know, as I say, built up to a crescendo all the way through, and uh, what a fantastic finish. And, and you know, I mean, to be, I mean, to be fair, Stephen, I suppose, to me, and, and again, obviously, I've, I've looked at this game for, for two different reasons. One, to, to write a report, a, you know, a match report on this game, and obviously one for this. And obviously, I, you know the result. It's not going to surprise It's not a different ending. But when, as I'm watching it, and, and I can't help but think, obviously, with, with what happened in, um, in Spain two years earlier to France, and, and that's, you know, being 3-1 up, you know, in extra time in, in a World Cup semi-final. And, you know, and here they are in their home championship semi-final. There's six minutes left and they're, you know, they're 2-1 down. You know, it takes incredible mental strength that I think possibly is overlooked by this French side based on the, you know, sort of the beauty and artistry that, 
that they displayed, but the, the mental strength going into those final six minutes is, is incredible. Oh, it's absolutely huge for them. You know, given how it went so wrong for them in such a, a dominant position in, uh, in Seville against West Germany, to, to go and do that, to come back from that blow, and the, and the manner of the goal that Jordao scores for the second one, but he hits it into the turf and it bounces up and over. So, you know, there's, there's that sense of misfortune again. So that whole sense of foreboding and here we go again must have been absolutely massive for them. And to get so close to kind of like to the tail end to be losing, not, not, not even on level terms, looking to get a winner to stop it going into penalties. This is a team that's on the brink of losing their own European Championship semi-final on home soil, and then to pull it out like that in such style at the end is just absolutely stunning. And I think it also goes to show as well is that Platini emerges as the hero at the end of this game. Let Demerg scores the two goals to get the, the, the opener, the equaliser as well. But if you get to sit there and watch it again, watch how Platini throws himself down in the hope of a penalty before the ball rolls to Demerg as well. Is that you know he's 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 doing the sleight of hand. So for part of that game, he's also the villain, because I don't think it was his greatest game. Certainly wasn't his greatest game of the tournament. Yet he ends it as the hero with this scene stealing moment at the end that that you know Jean Tigana makes for him as well. So he he kind of there's there's a, there's a degree to him being the profiteer at the end of this, you know. And and Gary's right, you know, um, you know Motson's lines on that on that on that finish is. You know, some of the some of the finest ever ever uttered by a, a British commentator. I mean, for you, Aidan, you know, and Stephen's mentioned there, you know, about Platini and you know, and the contributions by Demers, you know, and, and other players. But but ultimately, great players do that. Don't they? that that is what they do. Yeah, you know, you talked about his back to back hat tricks in the group games, um, the the winner against Denmark. But but you know, and, and he gets the you know he gets the first goal in the final, but. But great players stand up when, and that's and that's what sets them apart. You know, it's truly what sets them apart from other other players. That's right. You know, the phrase "cometh the hour, cometh the man." It's it's very true. It's a, it's an expression for a reason, isn't it? That the greats always find a way when it's really needed and it's really desperate. Um, you can think of other recent examples of the likes of Gerard at times for Liverpool and so on. You know, if anyone's going to crop up with the last minute desperate saving goal or winning goal, you know who it's going to be. Uh, similarly with France at this time. I mean, they, as much as they've been pouring forwards after Portugal had taken the lead, they were struggling to create anything really significant. And you, you start to wonder if the, the edginess that they must have been fearing, as the guys have said about how it all went wrong in 1982, uh, would be getting to them and the pressure. But yes, you, you're quite right about the mental strength to overcome that. Uh, and of course, the final goal was so utterly iconic. And yes, the man himself has to be the one for the moment, doesn't he? But, you know, th this was his tournament. And when you look back on these, these things with however many, 36 years of hindsight, but it doesn't take as long as that to, to pick out tournament highlights and moments. And that's where our memories are really forged rather than watching the whole thing. You know, you forget the, the first half where not a lot happened and, and you forget the various incidents or you forget him trying to win a penalty. He flopped over at the start of extra time as well, I think, because in a sort of tired attempt at a, at a tumble, uh, which, again, he's just trying to deceive the referee. But, you know, our collective memory is built on the key moments. And, of course, he was the man with the key moment. Hardly an isolated incident for him throughout this tournament because he had enough of these stellar key moments to, to deserve the plaudits that he got from it. I mean, has there been a, as an astonishing performance in the European Championships across the course of a championship than Platini in this one? I, I very much doubt it. I don't think so at all. But in this particular game, it's, it's the, the moments are few and far between, but the most iconic of all. <laughs> it, I mean, you know, we're, we're sorry, you know, we're coming to the end. Like I say, you know, we, we like to get the, through these rel relatively quickly, but I've got, I've got three separate questions. So I've got one for each of you this time. Um, Gary, you know, for you, it, it's just about, you know, taking us through, you know, what happens afterwards. Obviously, France could then go and meet Spain um, in the final. And it's, you know, I, you know, people will say, oh, you know, the semi-final was, you know, the final was always going to be an anti-climax after that final. But, but this French, I say this French side deserved this victory, but 
as I always seem to ask you, the, the right team won here, didn't they, in this particular um, tournament? Yeah, well, you know, you know, I'll answer those questions. But I I mean, yes, yes, they do. I mean, they did. I mean, that the best team won, not, not just the right team won, the best team won. And, you know, they, they, uh, I mean, I, I know we were talking about 82 and, you know, the French team of 82, I mean, love that scene. They were brilliant. They were brilliant. And uh, that game against Germany was, it's actually, I think it was the first article I wrote for these football times was about that game. And uh, I still think it's one of my favourite things I wrote because doing research, watching the game over and over again. Um, but yes, um, so they, they had, they got, they got over the line this time. And it's, been, it's interesting, I'm just sort of thinking as Aidan was talking then about um, Patini not on his best game. And there's a, there's a similarity to four years later, um, Van Basten scored all the goals through the tournament, got to the final, didn't have a, had a, a pretty ordinary game, scored one goal, made one goal, and, and, and actually won the, won the trophy for the Dutch. And, you know, and Patini got, got um, France in not his best game out of the, di the difficult game and into the final. And the final itself was, uh, was fairly flat, and that's probably as much to do with Spain and the tension that the French probably felt. Um, as anything else, and uh, I think with Platini got a uh, score from free kick, which Arcanardis fumbled over the line, and then uh, Bellon got that that only goal that French forwards ever got in the entire Parisian tournament in the last minute of the final to make it 2 0. But um, yeah, the final was pretty flat compared, and certainly compared to the, uh, the second half and the uh, extra time in this game. It, I mean, you know, for you, Stephen, I'm you know, I'm quite sure I, I, I know what the answer is going to be here, but. 1984 best European Championships. Yes, I think so, without without a doubt. You know, I had eight strong teams. Even when you're looking at Romania, you know they'd not qualified for a major tournament since the 1970 World Cup. Yet here they were with a, I think, still a teenage Georgie Hadji. You know, so you know they had the building blocks for absolutely everything that they could possibly want. You know, this was the start of, you know, one of Romania's strongest eras. Uh, you know, within well, within two years, you know, Stalby Crest won the European Cup. So this is a, a, a nation that is building towards better times. So you know, yes, there was no Italy at this this tournament. There was no the Netherlands weren't there, England weren't there. As ever with a, an eight team European Championship, there were always glaring omissions. But you know, you had to win your group to get there. So there were strong teams. You know, that was a you know Yugoslavia. You know, they got the. But, you know, they, they, they kind of fell flat on the face. But, you know, you, they still, you know, rose to get there. And then they were placed in, in what was a group of death, really, when you look at kind of like the Denmark of Elkiar and, and Laudrup, you had France in there. And it was a Belgium that were two years away from reaching the World Cup semi-finals. This is, you know, this is Jan Kuhlemans, this is Van der Eichen, this is, you know, Schifo, this is, you know, Eric Goretz, I think, is, is in there possibly. You know, Jean-Marie Faf, one of the greatest goalkeepers in the world at that time. So this was a, you know, a huge, huge tournament. You only have to look at the, the amount of goals that were scored and the, you know, the, the style of the goals. It was such a evocative tournament and, you know, a, a beautiful, beautiful tournament. And, and I think certainly, you know, I, I'll always love Euro 88. The 88 European Championships were, were brilliant as well. But I think... The, between the two, you know, if you're saying kind of like 88 is for the purists, you know, because it is the, the Soviet Union of, of Belenov and Protasov, it is Lobanovsky versus Mikols, you know, it, it is everything that is, is technically beautiful about football. But 84 is, is for the romantics, you know, it is, it is beautiful, it is, it is picturesque. It gives you absolutely everything, you know, if, if you've got a, you know, a cold, cold heart, you know, the 1984 European Championships would melt her. <laughs> what, a, what a great answer. I'm going to try that on my mum. When, she, when she's talking about the gentle touch of what a great programme it was, I'm going, to, I'm going to have a word about this. Um, right, Aidan, I'm really sorry. You, you get the last one. Um, so you, you mentioned um, Platini and his performance over, over the entire Championships. And, and again, I keep going back to this article that I've written. And obviously I wrote it as a as if I'd been at the game, I was a reporter at that game and, and sort of explaining how a player was going to have to go some to emulate, to come even close to emulating um, what Platini did in the 1986 World Cup that was to come in two years' time and then obviously Maradona steps up. Hmm. But out of, the, out of the two performances between Maradona and Platini, do you think Platini gets the, the credit he deserves or do you think 
essentially the very next tournament Maradona did for him and tarnished <laughs> that, that legacy, I suppose. Not tarnished it, but diminished the, the legacy of Platini's tournament. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's not on the script, I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, okay. I think the big difference between the two, and I don't, I'll come on to whether that affects how we perceive it in a sec, but the big difference I think between the two is that Platini had a better team around him than Maradona did. Um, you know, he was part of what was, as we've talked about at length, a magnificent midfield. Now, I'm not saying Argentina weren't a great side, of course they were. They would never have got as far as they did as a one man band, no. But he dragged them through uh, in, in some of the games to a greater extent than Platini had dragged France through. Now, he still dragged them through at some points, you now against Denmark in the opening game and so on, like we said. But at times, the, the performances from France as a whole were so impressive that it didn't require Platini as such to be the only person uh, Hitting the, hitting the key moments and so on. Whereas I think Maradona in 86, even though, say, in the final he didn't score, but he had a hand in a lot of it, and obviously the, the wonderful through for Burashaga's winner in, in the 86 final. So he was always there or thereabouts influencing matters. Um, again, Platini, of course, a lot of this flowed through him. He was the, the head of the diamond of the, of the four in midfield, if you like. You know, he's the, he's the, the, the pivot that it all flowed through. But... I think a lot of the perception is suffered because a European Championship isn't quite as high profile as a World Cup, and therefore we think of Maradona's achievement as greater. B, I think in as we've talked about in the United Kingdom at least, we didn't get to see this, and therefore it gets a bit more forgotten. Uh, and finally, C, I think Platini's own reputation has been tarnished so much in other ways, which is a shame because as a player he was absolutely majestic. There's, there's no other way to define it. It was sort of elegant, stylish, and absolutely majestic. So, a long rambling way of getting to the point of, I think, Maradona <laughs> was possibly the greater achievement because uh, he didn't have quite as good a side around him, or as good a colleagues around him as Platini did. And it was also in a, on a slightly grander stage too. Well done. Great, great recovery. All done without pausing the video to allow you thinking time. That was straight in, in, in real time, live as it happened. Um, guys, uh, you know, as always, like I say, I, I get the best bits. I just get to ask the questions and, and, and sit and ask. Um, you know, it's been wonderful. And I think, you know, I'm sure you'd all agree um, in the sentiment that, you know, hopefully when people have watched this, they will go away and, and watch this game in its entirety because you need... You need the quietness of that first half to then appreciate the second half and extra time. Don't just go to where the action is and start at the start of the second half. You've got to, you've got to see the first half. Even like we say, even if it's just for setting the scene in that beautiful French summer's evening that just sets it off. Um, Stephen, as always, an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Oh, Joey's always, Stu. Never tired of the chatting like this. Always. Aidan. <laughs> Brilliant by you on the final question. I am really sorry. It, it wasn't an intentional <laughs> thing. It's all right, <laughs> man. I, we're used to this kind of thing, Stu. This is, this is what you do. <laughs> Excellent. And I am really sorry. And Gary, as always, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful analogies um, and just uh, another great chat. I'm not sure we'll work David Bowen into the next one we do, but I'll give you some real advice. <laughs> uh, talking about football with your mates in a glass of beer ain't too bad, don't you? It is because I was wondering who Ziggy Star has played for, but you you put me right with that, so it was it was all right. Um, I guess um, I think we're, we're we're planning on doing this as a as a trilogy, right, guys? Just before we leave, so people got something to look forward to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pick another game, and, and uh, we've got plenty of cheers and some some belters, so I'm sure we'll come up with uh, another fascinating game. Starts the debate, of course, which one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the hardest part, picking the game. <laughs> so hopefully everyone, you know, you'll join us again when we will have definitely decided what the third game will be in this trilogy. And um, please keep watching. Thanks very much and goodbye.